Hello, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to this month's webinar, Approaching the Prospective Donor, Step 3 of the Cause Selling Cycle. My name is Pearl Hoagland, and I am the Senior Program Manager for the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, a couple notes. This webinar will be conversational, with the opportunity to ask questions during the webinar, as well as a Q&A following the presentation. Please submit any questions you have in the chat box using your GoToWebinar control panel. In the days following the webinar, you will receive an email with the slide deck and recording to review again at your leisure. You've got a cause, learn how to fund it. At the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, we enhance fundraisers' skills so they can develop and sustain donor relationships to advance their cause in today's growing giving landscape through a proven contemporary curriculum. This is presented by world-class nonprofit leaders, best-in-class faculty, and renowned philanthropists. We want to recognize our important affiliate partners who provide training and education to fundraisers nationally. Check out the map to find an institute in your community. If you are on social media, please give us a shout out using the hashtag SIPWebinar and tag us. Now I am very pleased to introduce today's presenter, the new director of the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, Tony Bell. Tony is a trusted and award-winning social enterprise leader, celebrating 20 years of diverse nonprofit experience, serving organizations all across the United States and internationally. His guidance and leadership have catapulted organizations to greater levels of sustainability, community engagement, and mission relevance. In 2010, Tony realized a vision and launched Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, Inc., a consulting firm focused on social change through the regional and global development of social enterprises. It is through his work at Mr. Nonprofit that he connected locally in South Florida with the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy at National Leadership Institute as a regional trainer and then joined our national training cadre in the summer of 2018. Tony's stellar reputation is the result of an undeniable passion for social change, proven creative strategies, and uncompromising commitment to excellence. He resides in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he also serves as president for the Center for Strategic Philanthropy and Civic Engagement and the facilitator and strategist for the Special Needs Advisory Coalition of Palm Beach County. Welcome, Tony, and thank you for being here. Great. Thank you so much, Pearl. That was a mouthful. Thank you so much for that uh, that great introduction. <laughs> and it's uh, it's exciting to be kind of on this side of the camera this month. So take thank you again for uh, taking ownership of the moderator position this month for our webinar. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, yeah, so we're just going to go ahead and, and jump right in. Again, just want to remind all of our attendees that this is meant to be conversational. So if at any point you have a question or a comment, uh, please put it in the chat box. Pearl will be monitoring those and she'll jump in and, and interject um, as appropriate. So everything we do at the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy revolves around our cause selling cycle. So as we said, kind of in the title of this particular webinar, today we're gonna to focus on step three of the eight step uh, cause selling cycle. It's all about relationships and step three is all about approaches. So uh, that's what we're gonna discuss over this uh, next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. So here's an outline of what we're going to be covering today in the webinar. So we're gonna discover ways to capture the interest of prospects understand how to make a positive first impression, find out how to leave the right first impression at your next event. I know that a lot of folks ask me those types of questions um, all the time as it relates to events and, and how do we maximize our return on investment uh, once the gala's over, right? Once we're done having our chicken dinner, uh, where do we go from here? So we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about that as well uh, in this webinar. So that's our outline. Uh, what are some of the objectives uh, for approach? So one of the objectives, of course, is to make a favorable or positive impression. Uh, another would be to gain the prospect's undivided attention. A lot of times that's not so easy, right? Even with ourselves, uh, to give somebody undivided attention. To develop positive interest in your cause. So that's an objective uh, for your approach to lead smoothly into the discovery phase of the interview, right? Because really what we're doing uh, pretty much in our, our first four uh, 
uh, modules of the cost selling cycle is really interviewing uh, our donors to make sure that they're the right fit for our cause. So, uh, so that's why we use that kind of, of terminology here. So again, an objective would be to lead smoothly into the discovery phase of the interview. So before we get started, we're going to take a quick poll and uh, we'd like to ask you, what is considered the average amount of time a prospect takes to decide whether or not to give? So do you think that that would be immediately? Two minutes, four minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour? A poll is going to launch on your screen. Please select your response. We'll give it about 30 seconds before we close the poll and take a look at the results. Great, thank you. Ten more seconds to get your answers in and then we'll close the poll. Boy, time flies. When you're having fun. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the results. Tony, take it away. Okay, great. So let's see here. So sharing poll results. I don't see any results just yet. I can tell you the results. We have it right here. 22% said immediately, 53% mm. the highest said two minutes, 15% at four minutes, 8% at 30 minutes, and then 2% said one hour. Oh, okay, super. So, you know, of course, this is really going to vary based on the the individual that, uh, you know, the prospect that you're meeting with. But uh, based on, on the research that we've used for our cost selling book, the answer really is four minutes. Uh, so again, you you have four minutes in in that kind of moment of truth, where uh, you're meeting with a, a prospect for them really to determine whether or not uh, they want to give to your cause, regardless of how phenomenal your cause is. So uh, so again, just uh, good information. So let's see, we're going to move on. My face keeps popping up in front of my. There we go, people can see me, okay, great. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention as we looked at the objectives and, and what we're gonna cover today is really there are, are one of, of two things that I hope you get out of today's webinar. So one would be that you have this, you know, just amazing aha moment and uh, there's, there's some content and information within here uh, that you're gonna be able to action the minute we're done with this webinar. And that's really going to significantly change uh, the way that you uh, approach uh, prospects and, and potential donors. The other thing that I would hope, if not that, that you really are getting the affirmation that, that you need and deserve to know that you're doing all of the right things. I know when, when I invest my time uh, to participate in, in webinars or, or training sessions, you know, my hope for myself is that one of those two things would happen uh, because I certainly don't mind walking out of a, a, a learning session feeling like I'm doing all of the right things. So just wanted to share that. And, and again, my hope is that at least one of, of two of those things happen for you today. Uh, so again, thank you for investing your time in, in our webinar and, uh, and what Sanford Institute of Philanthropy has to offer. So uh, we're going to start with scheduling a meeting and, uh, and delivering your message. So scheduling a meeting, again, some of this may seem very 101 for some of you, Other, others of you are emerging fundraisers, and, uh, and this may be, uh, we hope, really good information, right? So scheduling a meeting, gatekeepers, I can't stress the importance of building a relationship with gatekeepers, right? So, uh, so what does that mean? That means being respectful of their very important role. So we see uh, some real creative titles uh, in today's environment for gatekeepers, right? Some of them may be director of first impressions, right? Or even um, director of community engagement. 
right? So whoever the gatekeeper is, uh, you just wanna make sure whatever title they have, you just wanna make sure that you're very respectful of the very, very important role uh, that they have in, uh, in you being successful and meeting with your uh, potential donor. Be honest about your intentions. Right, so you want them to know upfront exactly why you are asking for this meeting to occur. Uh, use and remember their name. Again, everything that we teach around call selling is about relationships. So uh, your gatekeepers is no different. You're gonna build this relationship and certainly using their name uh, <clears throat> enhances your opportunity to do so. Right, we all love it when somebody uses our name. So, you know, thinking about how we feel in these kind of scenarios and, and treating someone the same way. Establish a rapport. Again, building the relationship, getting to know your gatekeeper. They can be your biggest asset and ally when it comes to getting in, in front of a, a donor or, you know, let's take it, the, you know, further down the cycle, you've made the ask and now you're just waiting for them to sign on the dotted line and having that relationship with the gatekeeper to be your ally and your ambassador uh, is, is just going to mean a lot uh, in terms of reading, uh, reaching your goals. And, and be thoughtful, right? Again, you don't want to waste their time. Uh, you don't want to get overly comfortable to where you, you know, you've got them on the phone and now you're keeping them for 20 minutes. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to sense that again as you build a rapport and, and a relationship with the gatekeeper. But uh, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, highlight uh, right out of the gate the importance of gatekeepers uh, in, your, uh, in your fundraising. So uh, when it comes to scheduling a meeting, uh, you know, you've, you've built your rapport with the gatekeeper. They're ready now to, to schedule a meeting. Uh, they, they know for, through true transparency what this meeting's going uh, to be all about. So when is the best time for the prospect? Uh, we definitely want to lean in towards what's best for them in terms of their schedule. Uh, we can't really be selfish about our schedule when it comes to uh, meeting with a, a potential donor. Uh, what's the best location? Some, you know, some folks like to meet at their office. Some like to meet at their home. Uh, some like to get points on their Starbucks membership. So some like to meet at Starbucks. Uh, so it, again, kind of leaning in to what is best for that potential donor in terms of meeting location. Uh, and, you know, and, and depending on uh, geographically where they're located, you know, you, you might come to an agreement to meet somewhere in between if it's, if it's a long haul uh, for, you, for you to meet with them. What I would say about that, though, is, you know, when you can, uh, think about what's best for you specifically when it comes to the location. So meeting at a prospect's home or office, you can just gather so much information about their passions, their hobbies, things that will allow you to have a deeper conversation about their personal interests and just another opportunity for you to um, build rapport and solidify that, that personal relationship with your, uh, with your potential donor. So um, whenever you have the opportunity and it's in your control, uh, definitely meeting at their home or office will provide you with a lot of insight. Uh, in, into that individual, and again, how you can nurture and, and kind of move that uh, relationship forward. So there are, oh, and then of course, recognize the first appointment often requires prior uh, calls, emails, or letters, right? It may take a lot of effort uh, to get that first meeting. So again, don't get discouraged if it takes numerous phone calls, numerous emails. If you're sending letters, again, don't, um, don't get discouraged if it takes, you know, numerous uh, points of contact for you to uh, to finally get that that initial meeting on your schedule. So you've got the meeting, uh, you've got a happy gatekeeper, and uh, and now you're about to uh, deliver the message. So what does that look like, right? So your message is a blend of symbols to influence the prospect's attitude or behavior. Right, so we'll start there. Uh, it involves both verbal and nonverbal elements, and we're going to dig deeper into both of those a little bit further along uh, in, in the webinar. 
but again, delivering uh, delivering the message or message is a blend of symbols uh, to influence the prospect's attitude or behavior. I just wanted to stress that again. If verbal and nonverbal messages are in conflict, the listener will generally rely on the nonverbal message. And uh, one of the, the blessings and I guess curses of being in this industry for the last 20 years is I have lots of examples. And I'm sure many of you that are joining us, uh, regardless of your tenure uh, in the industry, you know, have lots of uh, lots of great stories to share. But I, I had the opportunity to go through a training session where they videotaped uh, my interactions mm -hmm. with uh, with individuals through role play, and it was as much as I hated it. Uh, it was really uh, quite the eye opener. And what I found I, I do just out of habit is when someone is communicating with me, I tend to nod my head. And so my nodding my head sends a positive body language message to the person that's speaking to me. So they could be saying something that I am totally not in favor of, but my body language, because I'm nodding in acknowledgement that I'm listening to them, is sending a message that I'm agreeing what's being said before I even have an opportunity to uh, to agree or not agree. So just keeping in mind, you know, what our uh, body language is as we're listening and what message that might send to the person speaking to where they they are coming up with an assumption of your response prior to you even responding because your body language is is saying something. So uh, so that was a real eye opener for me that again, just nodding my head in acknowledgement uh, that I'm, I'm kind of focused and, and in the zone and listening uh, was sending a preemptive uh, approval of, uh, of what was being said to me. And then of course, I'm always conscious about things like, you know, my arms being crossed whenever someone's, you know, talking to me. Uh, living here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, you know, and having the opportunity to travel around the country, especially during the fall and the winter, uh, I get cold pretty quickly. So crossing my arms is, you know, part of my kind of, you know, my, my warmth strategy. So I'll often be very honest with folks and say, you know, pardon me for crossing my arms, but I'm freezing. So uh, at least that kind of breaks down any perceived barrier uh, that my body language may send to uh, to someone who's delivering a message uh, to me. So just again, always being conscious of of our body language. Uh, sometimes my hands could go crazy uh, even in a webinar setting like this. So just being you know kind of mindful of of that and, and what my style may look like uh, when it comes to uh, my nonverbal messaging. So, uh, so those are some tidbits for, you know, for delivering the message. Uh, your first impression. So this is so important, right? You, mo you might only get one chance, so make it count. Uh, I'll say, you know, it's not that you might only get one chance. I mean, you get one chance at, at a first impression. So, uh, so you definitely want to make sure that it counts. And so we're going to dig a little bit deeper uh, into first impressions uh, right now. Can you tell I love uh, digging deep into things? So uh, nonverbal communication. So like we were saying, body language transmits feelings and emotions. So being very mindful of that. Uh, facial expressions. Uh, I am a horrible poker player. Uh, you can read everything that I'm thinking pretty much through my facial expressions. Uh, and I kind of like that about me. And, and I, I think that that underscores the level of, of transparency uh, that I bring to, uh, to anything and everything that I do. But just, you know, in, in certain scenarios, uh, you, you have to, um, you know, you have to pull back on that and, and you can't be as expressive. Uh, so just, you know, again, being mindful of, of your facial expressions and when is the right uh, time for you to, like me, be totally transparent uh, in, in what your face is, is saying. Uh, your stance and posture is is important. Uh, you know, aside from from perhaps any uh, physical challenges, you know, doing what you can to uh, make sure that you have good posture, that uh, you know that that you're in in a a solid uh, a solid stance, right? You're you you mean business. 
this is not a walk along the beach, uh, but you're you're just in that stance to let them know that that you're in your power mode, and and uh, you're you're ready to you know you're just ready uh, to do business. Uh, grooming, so uh, you know, grooming can can take on. Uh, you know, some personal side effects, so to speak, uh, but just making sure that uh, in your in your attire that, uh, again, you, you're not uh, wrinkled for, for, you know, lack of a better example, but again, just, you know, making sure that that you look you look put together uh, basically on that uh, clothing and accessories. So being mindful. Of, of who you're meeting with, because again, none of these folks that you're meeting with are strangers to you, because through our cost uh, selling cycle, you have done your, your prospecting and you have done your pre-approach prior to this engagement with a potential donor. So you know a lot of things about, uh, you know, potentially their culture and, and their work environment. Uh, so you can think about that, you know, as it relates to, uh, to clothing and accessories, you know, and, and look the part. So look the part does not mean blue suit and pearls, right? I mean, looking the part means being authentic to yourself, uh, being professional, uh, however that's defined uh, within your organization and knowing when to pivot and shift our appearance, our appearance, pardon me, based on our audience. And, uh, and so I'll give you a, a good example of that. I, uh, when I was doing fundraising for a national organization here in South Florida, I had the, uh, the responsibility of a golf tournament. And uh, some of you out there may have that same responsibility where a golf tournament is, is one of your areas of responsibility for fundraising. So one of the things that I wanted to do to just kind of um, amp up the experience for our attendees is I wanted one of those kind of, you know, pimped out uh, golf carts. And the whole philosophy was that, you know, I would get this pimped out golf cart donated and uh, foursomes would buy a raffle ticket and a foursome would be picked. And now they'd have this, you know, pimped out uh, golf cart uh, to use throughout the tournament. And uh, fortunately, uh, we have a lot of golf cart builders or, you know, vendors uh, here in South Florida. Uh, so I went out to a vendor uh, that I knew was in our local community that was making just really cool uh, golf carts. And so I, I did the, you know, did research on, on the website, got an understanding of the products that, that they offered, uh, understood who the leadership was, uh, went in there with, with my proposal and walked into this golf cart company, you know, in my navy blue uh, Kenneth Cole suit and my shiny shoes and walked in with my folder and walked into a room full of people in like tank tops and shorts. Well, the minute I walked in the door, they looked at me like I had to have had at least five heads, maybe 12, but at least five. So I immediately knew that there was going to be a disconnect uh, just because of, of the attire that I had selected for this particular meeting. So uh, they could never get past the, the five heads that I have. So that engagement did not go so well. Uh, like I said, fortunately, there are many of those types of suppliers in South Florida. So I learned my lesson and I went to another supplier in our community, this time in jeans, a polo shirt and uh, and some you know casual shoes. Whole different level of engagement, uh, much more warmly received uh, in that environment. And really because my attire was mimicking the attire that they're used to uh, within their their company and their organization. So that's just an example of how we're, you know, historically for me, look the part means, you know, my my Kenneth Cole. Well, actually, I buy everything from Express, but you know, so my Express suits. Uh, but I needed to learn and understand when it was necessary for me to pivot from my uh, my style, uh, so that it it was. Uh, more easily accepted and digested by uh, the folks that I was meeting with. So maybe that story was a little too long, but uh, that's the story and I learned from it. <laughs> uh, 
more nonverbal stuff. So, uh, so nonverbal language uh, stuff is one of those technical terms I use every now and then. Uh, so representing your cause, uh, get the prospect to take you seriously, right? Because that's going to be um, represented and kind of determined right in that very first moment of truth. Uh, a respectful appearance is an added compliment, right? Again, it's a compliment to them because they know that you care enough to be your best when you meet with them. And no matter your message, it's your visual appearance that speaks first. So again, uh, not asking you to be anything or anyone other than who you are, but just knowing that uh, a visual appearance makes a difference and thinking about that uh, prior to your, to your meeting with a, a prospect or a potential donor. Pearl, are there any questions that have come in that, um, that we should take a look at or answer? Any comments? Yes, actually, like thank been, you, Tony. I feel like I've been talking too long. <laughs> no, we do have a question. Um, the question is, how do you correct your body language? And my uh, assumption is that means maybe on the spot, how do you maybe assess and correct while you're in that meeting? Yeah, so that that's a, a really a really great question, and and I wish I had a really great answer. And and what I what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I, I guess it depends on the cues that that you're observing from the person that that you're talking to. So, you know, sometimes again because I've got these hands, um, you know, I might see someone that I'm talking to look at my hands more than they're looking in my eyes. Um, so, you know, so that'll be a cue to me to, okay, Tony, just, you know, put your hands on your thighs um, or sit on them. There have literally been times, I'm going to do it right now, where, you know, I sit on my hands uh, in a meeting uh, because, again, I've noticed through kind of their um, nonverbal communication that my hands were distracting. So that's, you know, that's just kind of, of an example uh, you know, I have had, and and this, you know, this happens with with men as well. And I'm going to go there. Um, you know, sometimes maybe I've been a, a little too casual, and uh, and you know, maybe you know, I've got this button button today. So well, maybe you know, it was a hot 95 degree day in South Florida, and you know, I'm this unbuttoned. Well, I might get a a cue again just from their nonverbals and where their eyes are going that maybe you know I need to button this up and so you know and, and I would just do that I would I might say oh you know it was hot outside and, and then I'll just you know I'll, I'll kind of correct course again it depends on on you uh, it depends on who you're 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 chatting with but those are just some examples of of how I might pivot um, you know based on on just what I'm seeing from the, the nonverbal cues from, from who I'm talking to. Do you think that helps, Pearl? Yes, this is great conversation. Someone just responded to that and asked, in that example, would it be appropriate to remove the jacket from your earlier example? Okay, so I'm a, I, I sweat. So I would not remove my jacket because it would be hard. It would be like a really bad scenario, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just because, uh, because because I might be too sweaty. But yes, I mean, absolutely. Again, and, and there's nothing wrong with, I'm going to stress this, you're going to hear it again. There's nothing wrong with being you and being human in that scenario. You know, it's 98 degrees outside. I wore this this jacket as part of my professional represent representation today. We've we've shaken hands. We've had that moment of truth. I've gotten through my first four minutes. So hopefully you're ready to, to make a donation to my organization. Now I'm going to say, you know, it, it, it's a little warm in here or, or I'm still roasting from the temperature outside. I mean, I think the whole country is in at least the hundreds this week. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to take my jacket off. Thank you so okay. much. Just keeping it real. Hashtag keep it real. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. <laughs> oh, sure, of course. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. So your your voice again. You know, I, I'll be hypercritical. Uh, this is again somewhere where where I've really had to work on, right? And just talking louder doesn't make it more impactful, right? So, 
so you know learning that uh just talking louder doesn't necessarily mean they're going to hear what you're saying any more clearly uh so here are some things to watch out for and that's probably in one of these right so st uh, strive for clarity and articulation so you know even throughout this webinar i mean i'm being mindful of the time i'm looking at my you know at my phone uh trying to make sure that i'm not rushing through the content uh, that I'm literally, you know, dotting my I's and crossing my T's in the delivery of, of my information. Uh, watch your volume. I, I kind of uh, address that. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> if I'm meeting with a potential donor, you know, I, again, I, I want to kind of mimic part of their style as well. So if they're a little more soft spoken, I'm probably going to lean into being a little more soft spoken. If they're more that type where, Tony, God, it's so good to see you. And, and you know, I've been looking forward to this meeting. Uh, you know, tell me what you've got. And then I'm going to say, Carol, I am so excited to be here too. You know, and, and I might, you know, I, I'll match that level of volume. Um, so again, it's it's kind of, you know, mimicking their volume. Uh, but but recognizing that when it comes to my volume, kind of a, a, a more mid-level volume is probably the right thing to do. Uh, and, and increasing my volume doesn't mean that they're accepting or digesting the information any differently. Okay, so just, you know, just watching our volume. Uh, modulation for emphasis. Uh, so, so again, just, you know, um, changing your tone. Uh, from from high to low uh, to emphasize certain points that you're trying to get across in in your communication or uh, in your presentation. Your rhythm, your cadence. Again, you know, um, if you're sometimes you might be quick in your delivery of information because you're mindful of the limited amount of time that you have, but sometimes your your rhythm and and your cadence, if if you're too fast, your motivation again might be, okay, I've got limited time, I've got to cut to the chase, uh, but that can also be perceived as being nervous. Uh, so, so again, you know, being mindful of, of, of your rhythm and, and, and your cadence as, as you're delivering, uh, you know, delivering your, your presentation or your information. Uh, the rate of speech, and, uh, and then body language. So um, I'm really interested to hear, I've shared some of, you know, kind of, again, total transparency, uh, you know, my body language issues. Uh, so I'd love to hear from some of you. So again, in, in the chat room, uh, please share with us what, you know, what are some of your challenges with your own body language that you've identified or uh, what I'd really love to hear because it's great to learn from, from what we see in others, right? What is What are some um, body language no-nos uh, that you've seen um, from folks that you've interacted with? So Pearl, let's give folks a, a few minutes to kind of share, uh, you know, with us what, what some of those are, and then let's report that back out to, uh, to our attendees. Sounds great. And for the sake of, um, for timing, we'll do, I'll look, maybe just select one or two, um, some as they come in. All right. Wow, we have many, let's see. This is exciting, I love doing this. I know, looking over the donor's head. Oh, that's a good one. Twirling their hair, looking at the cell phone. Um, and then the last one I'll do is don't look away while talking to someone one-on-one. -on -one. And we have some other great ones too, but I'll, I'll keep it at those. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. You know, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I love all of those. And, you know, and again, we're, we're, all, um, we're all learning at every stage of our career. Um, I even that last one I can be guilty of sometimes is talking to someone and then just kind of turning my head and and that you know that's kind of a a sign of of my discomfort like I can't look in I can't look straight in their eyes anymore I need like I just need to move <laughs> uh, move my head so I, I think that those were all really really good good examples oh yeah on the the twirling of of the hair um, and not even so much twirling of the hair you know it's um, you know, today, guys, you know, we've, we've all got a lot of, there's a lot of facial hair going on in the world these days. So, you know, a lot of times just kind of pulling at the beard or, you know, rubbing, rubbing the side of the beard. So those kind of things can, uh, 
can sometimes uh, really turn folks off. So uh, again, like Pearl said, I'm sure there were tons of great ones, but thank you guys for uh, for kind of shouting out there what uh, what kind of your your pet peeves are in, in terms of uh, of body language. So let's see here. So your your initial greeting. Uh, you know, thank the prospect for the meeting. Again, everything we do is about relationships, so uh, you can't thank people enough for, regardless of for where their level of commitment may go, but the commitment of time uh, is certainly something worth celebrating, and so we, we definitely want to make sure we we thank them uh, for that. Uh, avoid kind of trite or cliche greetings, you know, uh, hi, Carol, how's your day going? You know, I mean, Carol's been asked 40 times already, and it's only 11 a.m. How are days going? Uh, so, so think about something more exciting, like Carol. What's the most exciting thing that's happened in your day today? You know, and really kind of in, engaging right out of the gate that way. Um, it's, it's you can't, you know, you you can't answer with my day is going okay, or, or just okay. I mean, it really gets them to think about, wow, what is the most you know, exciting or meaningful thing that's happened to me so far today? And get them to this place of appreciation and celebration uh, right out of the gate uh, by asking them you know, those types of, of questions uh, or, or that type of approach in your greeting. Uh, plan your greeting in advance. Keep it simple, respectful, and confident. Uh, failure to prepare in advance can lead to stammering or faltering speech. Again, whenever you have an opportunity to role play <clears throat> these scenarios, you know, please do so. <clears throat> Create that donor persona uh, of the individual that you're going to meet with <clears throat> and practice that uh, with a coworker or, or with a friend or a mentor. You know, give them that persona and have them be that person. Uh, for you to to rehearse your uh, your initial greeting and, and your presentation with. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. So the handshake. So maintain eye contact. Uh, you know, apply firm, consistent pressure. Um, you know, it's not a competition. Uh, although sometimes you will shake somebody's hand and it feels like a competition. Uh, but just be you know be firm. But but again, the the handshake is not a competition. Uh, hands should be met at equal distance. Uh, many of you, you know, know all of this. Uh, again, it's going to vary depending on, you know, on the individual. Uh, but you know, here we're we're really just sharing with you, you know, best practices around uh, around an initial greeting. Uh, other tips, um, you know, it, it's it's commonly known that a woman should initiate the handshake with a man, right? There, you, you're there to do business. You're passionate about about what you're doing, um, and you want to uh, you want to show that. So you do not need to wait for somebody else to uh, to initiate the handshake. And uh, if your palm tends to be moist, carry a small handkerchief. Again, total transparency. I'm a sweater, and so I do this. Um, you know, I, I I just have to. And uh, and you know, I, I I get worked up because I'm so excited, not because I'm nervous or I'm intimidated, but just I'm excited. I I, I care about what I'm doing. I'm I'm passionate about this cause that I'm I'm representing. I'm I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity to meet with this potential donor. So a lot of times kind of that that nervous energy for me and the sweaty palm, you know, comes from a place of excitement, not a place of um, intimidation or, or lack of security, but it can be perceived that way. So, um, you know, so be mindful of that. Proxemics. So this is the physical distance uh, individuals prefer to maintain between themselves and others, right? So carefully kind of test this with your prospect. You know, what is their their comfort zone? Um, you know, if, if this is their face and you're like that, probably not. Um, but again, you'll you'll know that based on uh, the body language and reading the body language of the person that you're meeting with. You know what? What is you know what is their pro proxemic? You know, in, in terms of of space, uh, comfort zones tend to change with gender, status, or age. Um, I think we all can embrace that. Um, four to twelve feet could be a good distance in which to begin with a new potential donor. Uh, I don't know. Twelve feet sounds like quite the distance for me, but again, this is kind of based on 
on best practices and, and research done to uh, create our cost selling uh, book. So uh, again, four to, to 12 feet is, is kind of what's considered a, uh, a best practice. And the intimate zone should be entered only by invitation or during a handshake. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do um, is, is personable in that, you know, we're changing lives. And, and so there's a lot of feel good around, around this work, or at least I hope you're feeling good um, around the great work that you're doing. So, you know, so I work with a lot of huggers. Uh, so people that, that like to hug. Um, so you generally, at least from my experiences, I'll learn this intimate zone at the end of the first um, engagement where I will go to naturally hand, you know, naturally shake their hand and again, thank them for their time, you know, uh, and, and in doing so, that's when usually someone will say, you know, I'm a hugger. Um, and so, you know, so they, they want to go in for the hug. Now, how you react to that is up to your individual style, how you lean in or lean out of that. So uh, typically I will lean in um, initially with a two armed hug. Um, if that initial hug for some reason seems uncomfortable, then um, I will know moving forward that I will lean in with a one armed hug. I'm still not gonna minimize um, or uh, disregard uh, the way that, that they like to interact. Uh, but again, you have to also you know, maintain your own comfort zone <laughs> and your own intimate zone. So again, do you do what's right for you, but understanding uh, the perception from the potential donor if you totally lean out of that um, opportunity. Uh, so that's what I'll say about that. Like I said, I'm a hugger, and so when people want to hug at the end of a meeting, you know, I, I think that's awesome. I, I don't discourage that. But I also know that that's not everybody's style, um, and not everyone embraces the embrace. Uh, communication barriers. Let me check my time. Tony needs to probably talk a little faster. So communication barriers, again, you know, minimizing jargon. Um, you know, staying away from uh, distractions, uh, making sure that you um, have sufficient time, minimizing interruptions as best you can. A lot of times I'll just, I'll go ahead and just open Pandora's box and I'll tell the potential donor, look, I know life happens, you're running a business. If a call comes in that you need to take, please take it, right? So just recognizing the importance of their day-to-day -day activity and just kind of setting the, the bar right there that if you have a call come in, take it. But doing whatever you can to minimize any other type of, of exterior in, interruptions. You know, again, being mindful of, of odors and lighting, I would say noises. So, you know, sometimes you meet at coffee houses and you happen to to have to sit right near the, the barista and all of a sudden they're grinding beans like nonstop. So, you know, the sound is, is just not uh, the best place for, uh, for, your, for your meeting. And, and again, poor listening. You have to really lean into the conversation, uh, do whatever you can to uh, present, uh, prevent distractions from um, getting the way of you just being a really um, engaged and active listener. Uh, build a foundation of trust. Uh, prospects don't want fact sheet style knowledge. They want to know they can trust you. Build tr trust through a consistent display of integrity. And uh, integrity is not a, a short term, uh, you know, goal, right? It's a long term commitment that builds donor loyalty and your authority over the long haul. None of us are doing this work and trying to engage with donors. Uh, for a one hit wonder, right? We want them to uh, be ongoing investors in our, our mission. And, and so we wanna set, up, set ourselves up and the organization up uh, for long-term commitment from our, uh, from our donors. So some meeting tips, uh, introduce a solution. So when you're meeting with a donor, right? Don't just talk about, we need this, we want this, but share with them uh, the solutions that your cause is providing, right? Uh, whoops. And then visual appeal, use impactful photos, drawings, or other visuals 
And if you're gonna use a PowerPoint, again, be mindful of the amount of time that you have and, and keep it brief. Uh, types of approaches, I've got seven of those. I think I can do them pretty quickly. Um, also, just as a reminder, you guys will get this deck after uh, the webinar. So if I breeze through some of this uh, pretty quickly, uh, you'll have it to refer to. Uh, but just kind of the seven types of approaches. So there's your relevant benefit approach. That's when you already know the issues uh, and areas that are the most of interest to your prospect. Again, a lot of this you should know because you've been really great at your prospecting and pre-approach you know, prior to meeting with your potential donor. So impact approach, um, know the prospect's dominant gifting motive, uh, curiosity approach, know something about the prospect and even one of their hot button issues. The compliment approach, um, you know, signals your host, your honest, sorry, your host, your honest interest in the prospect. Uh, I see that you support many um, organizations that are working with uh, folks with special needs in our community. Thank you so much for doing that. Here's how our organization is meeting the, the needs and providing solutions for that part of our community as well. Uh, so that's an example. And then the referral approach, uh, which is super great, right? Because now you've been referred by someone, so you've got some um, higher level of integrity and acceptance already. Um, the educational approach, again, this works well um, with uh, virtual meetings. And then the hands-on approach, you know, providing visible images, uh, stirring their interest, um, you know, makes a multiple sense appeal. And the hands-on approach too is, you know, there's a very popular, uh, the Venabon model, popular fundraising model, that is all about bringing folks in, pardon me, for tours, of your organization for those of you that have a brick and mortar opportunity. So using this hands-on approach. Real quickly, events, you know, know your audience, set a single goal, choose the right type of event, think creatively and budget realness, right? Be real about your budget for your, for your events, create a compelling uh, invitation. This is all of the stuff, you know, ensure a dynamic experience, right? This is all the stuff that you're, <clears throat> pardon me, doing anyway to make sure that the ROI that night uh, is where it needs to be. So during the event, you know, making sure that customer service is top of mind, check in, nobody likes to stand in queue forever to check in for an event. Making sure that your staff and board are circulating throughout the event so that they are serving as your, you know, brand ambassadors through the event and making real and genu genuine uh, connections uh, at the event so that you're connecting and that you keep the event moving forward. This is the big one, right? So this is how you build your ROI after the event. Thanking all of your attendees, doing whatever you can during the event to, um, to get as much information um, about who's attending your event. So if a corporate sponsor you know, has brought nine guests, making sure you're doing whatever you can to capture their personal information. Pursue every potential relationship. Follow up with folks individually after the event. And examine, <coughs> pardon me, examine and critique the event. But this is also an opportunity as you pursue potential relationships to reach out and get feedback from your attendees, you know, on the events and, and their overall experience. So before we launch into to q and I just want to remind you, we've got this great summary available for you to download. So this is a, you know, a really good summary of, of all of the stuff that we've covered in today's webinar. And it also, you know, is, is a great summary of this particular chapter of our, of our cost selling cycle. So, you know, please print this, share it with everybody in your team, share it with your board members, because it's, um, it's a really, really great summary. So with that, let's see, it's about 10 minutes to the hour. And Pearl, I think it's okay now to go ahead and open up some Q&A. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony. We have some really good questions coming in. Um, so as a reminder, we're now in the Q&A session. Please feel free to send your questions in the chat box. I am going to get started. 
The first question was, can you talk about how to develop the presentation and dialogue moving towards the ask? Dialogue, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so we, um, we actually have an entire module on the ask. Uh, and, and so Pearl, I can't remember, do we have an archived webinar on the ask that you? We, that's a great question, we do, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so what I would suggest, because that takes a really deep dive into how to prepare your PowerPoints and, and your presentation, uh, you know, in, into making the ask. So at the risk of sounding like I'm deflecting <laughs> the, the question, I just think, you know, it, it would be more meaningful to invest the time in, in going into our library and, and reviewing that webinar that is very specific and very detailed about, about making the ask and preparing your messaging uh, for such. Yes, and I believe it is called Perfecting the Pitch, and you can find it on our website, sanfordinstituteofphilanthropy.org, if you look at past webinars. Great. All right, I am going to keep going. Um, what the other next questions question, do we have? We have we have time for a few more questions. Um, strong eye contact. A few people actually asked about this, and I know I share this question too. How do you maintain the balance between having very good eye contact and then making someone uncomfortable. How do you find that balance? Uh -oh. Tony, we seem to have lost your audio. Okay, or am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay, sorry, I do not know what happened. Technology. <laughs> it said that my connection had been compromised. Oh. So that um, sounds you, sketchy. Were you able to hear my question? <laughs> I didn't, I'm sorry. No, I no, need no, to hear wait. the question again. So we've a few people have asked this about eye contact. How do you maintain an appropriate balance between making really good eye contact but that, or making someone uncomfortable? Yeah, so I, you know, I, so for, for me, you know, I'll, I'll look at, you know, I, I'll tend to blink maybe a little more often than, than usual. Um, I like to smile a lot. So, you know, I, I may, like right now I'm looking at you and I want to make sure that you are hearing what I'm saying. This is really passionate. You know, I'm really passionate about this work. The work that we're doing is making a, you know, a huge difference and you can really make a difference with us. So, so I'm not necessarily looking away, but I'm, I'm kind of changing the intensity of my, my facial expression, um, you know, kind of leaning in and, and leaning out kind of, you know, through smiling and not smiling, although I'm not breaking my eye contact. Does that make any sense? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I know personally I share that same question, so I'm going to practice that in my next meeting. Um, all right, moving on. This is a bit, this is a little similar. Uh, an organization mentioned, or a participant mentioned that if you've done your research on your prospect, uh -huh. how do you share that and balance that between showing that you've done your research but not seeming like a stalker? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, you're right. It, it it has to be, you know, it has to be kind of kind of subtle. But I, I'll I'll tell you that um, any any serious. I just said um, didn't I? I need to put a dollar in a bucket because I'm trying to remove <laughs> that word from my vocabulary. So what I would what I would say is that a serious donor is going to appreciate that you've done some research. They're going to appreciate that you know something about them. So. I typically lean in pretty heavily on LinkedIn when it comes to that. So I, you know, I may have learned other things through, you know, Facebook or through Instagram, uh, but the things that I totally acknowledge um, and am, am totally transparent about are the things that I learn about them through LinkedIn, right? Because of all of our social media opportunities uh, or social networks, uh, to do our prospecting, that is the one that's really designed, you know, uh, in a professional space. So I would feel really comfortable saying, I saw on LinkedIn that you liked an article 
published uh, by Beth Cantor. You know, I follow Beth Cantor too, and, and I'm always so excited when she shares a new tidbit on how I can market, you know, our cause. So, so leaning in, you know, and in, in kind of in, in that regard, or, you know, I saw on LinkedIn that you liked something uh, posted by the, the Humane Society. I love the Humane Society. I have two dogs. Do you have any dogs? You know what I mean? Or so that's how I would I would shape and, and present that. Uh, I wouldn't go in and say, you know, I, I know that your favorite cake is German chocolate cake. You know, that almost <laughs> sounds a little too deep. <laughs> you know, again, and unless I had seen something on LinkedIn where they had, you know, some chef had posted a recipe or, or some tutorial on making a cake and they liked it for the whole, you know, then, then I would, I would probably lean into that. Thank you so and much. These again Tom. are all based on my personal style. Yeah. These no, are all I again, based great. on my personal style and, and where I'm, I'm comfortable. So we do have some more questions. Um, if we weren't able to get to your questions, what we're going to do is send them to Tony and he will answer them and we'll send out a separate email with answers to those remaining questions. So thank you to everyone who asked questions. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So I'll, I'll look forward to, you know, to answering any questions we couldn't get to on the live webinar. Perfect. And if you'd like to contact Tony, his contact information is available to you on the screen. You will also receive this information when you get the slide deck in a follow-up email in the next few days along with the recording. Tony, what is your most what is the most important takeaway for everyone on this webinar? So I, I sound like a, a broken record a lot of times in, in this messaging. And, and I think it's again just based on my own personal experience. Please be you own who you are, feel confident in what you're doing, never apologize for your passion for the great work that you're doing. That doesn't mean that you don't need to understand when to pivot and when to make adjustments, but own who you are and then just pivot and adjust as you need to. That would be my greatest recommendation and takeaway. Thank you so much, Tony. All right, have we left you wanting more? We hope so. The second edition of our textbook, Cause Selling, A Guide to Relationship-Driven Fundraising is now available on Amazon and Kindle. You can download a first, uh, first chapter today for free just by going to causeselling.org and putting in your information. And don't miss our next webinar on August 21st. Winter is coming. Now is the time to plan your end of year campaign. If you are looking to plan an end of year campaign, register today. And we have another, I mean, we have a great presenter lined up for that. So please join us. Yes, Katie Adams Farrell, if you watched our webinar on cause selling, she's coming back and we cannot wait to have her back. Thank you again to our audience and to you, Tony, to help us continue to improve our monthly webinar series and ensure that we're providing value. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey. It will launch as soon as the webinar ends. Um, and in closing, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for everything that you do for your community, and we'll see you on August 21st. Great, thank you so much, Pearl. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, bye-bye.